All right. Good morning and good afternoon to all of our audiences around the world. Welcome to the first forum for World Education online webinar. I'm Angel Chen Wei, a FWE Young Leader member. I'm proud to welcome all of you to today's session that has speakers from Europe, Asia, America, and Africa. All right. Good morning, good morning and good, good afternoon, afternoon to all of our, our audiences around the world. world. Welcome, Welcome to the non-profit organization, which aims to encourage the conversation among the and makers, education experts, and business leaders. FWE aims to provide a inclusive Asia for business and economic Good morning and good afternoon to all of our audiences around the world. To the skills and knowledge requirement of the current and the future global society. It's global strength, desire to progress, and sustainability. Today we're going to have a dynamic conversation among the leaders from business and foundation sector, sectors and discuss how do we finance the future of education and align resources with needs. We're going to begin with the Young Leaders panel and discussing education and the job market. So first, please allow me to introduce the participants from the four continents. First, we have Basan Ingebrecht from South Africa, who is the founder of Hura Online. And we have Tan from Thailand, who co-founded the data company and is working with the Ministry of Education and is helping Thai education policy development. And we have Alice Amega, who is from Ghana and is a PhD student study at Cambridge University. And we have Danny McNeil from the US, who is a social impact advisor and program manager at Second News. Welcome to the panel, everyone. With the first question, how are your countries doing? Has COVID affected the job market for the young employee, especially new graduates? What jobs can we do now? What options are there for the young, new graduates and the ones who have not finished their degrees? With, with the first, first question. question. How, How are your countries doing? Has COVID, has COVID affected, affected the job market, market for the young, young employees, especially, especially new graduates? graduates? What, what jobs, jobs can, can we do, do now? now? What, what options, options are there, there for the young, young new graduates, graduates and the and ones, ones who have not, not finished their degrees? degrees. All right, excellent. Um, sorry, it seems like there's some feedback on the line. Perhaps it's there's the first uh, somewhere close to the speaker, which is uh, not on my side right now. But um, nonetheless, what a privilege to be here um, in South Africa. Um, yes, COVID has affected us immensely. Um, right now, we're still at level two of lockdown. And um, I have to say, we wanted change and we got big change. So lots of excitement amongst this pandemic as well. Um, what excites me the most, I have to say, is the notion of people and especially graduates um, realizing that their security is not necessarily in the degrees um, you know, of their education, but rather the ability um, to create upon what they've learned and uh, the ability to execute upon what they've been taught. So it's that whole notion of the employer mindset as opposed to the employee. Um, in South Africa, new business registrations um, are up by about 35%. Um, in the past two months. So it, it clearly shows you a trend um, that people are creating their own businesses. And, um, you know, with business creation, there's job opportunities that's coming along as well. Uh, 
um, in South, in South Africa. Africa new um, for for Thailand, um, I think the COVID uh, containment is very successful here in Thailand. Um, there's only been one one co local COVID case in the past four months. And luckily that hasn't caused any widespread. Um, but obviously with any successful COVID story comes the economic impact to the country. Um, no foreigners are coming into the country. And obviously for a country where the tourism sector um, contributes nearly 20% of the um, GDP, um, this is a very concerning issue to deal with. Uh, the the Thai government has launched an economic stimulus, just like any other country, like the U.S. and Europe. Um, you know, injecting tens of billions of dollars in hopes that um, a lot of SMEs don't go bankrupt. Um, no more employees are getting laid off. But obviously, this is a very temporary uh, way to solve the problem, especially when we don't know uh, how other countries are going to uh, move forward about this. As far as I understand, um, uh, this year, up to 500,000 new graduates are at risk of being in permanent unemployment because they have skill sets that are very specialized. And obviously, the job vacancies around the country are very low. So uh, this is another big concern. Um, and uh, there are predictions that up to 3 million people would be unemployed by the end of the year. Uh, which is very alarming because Thailand's unemployment rate has been under 1% for the past 10 years. Um, to really show the impact of COVID, um, during the 2008 financial crisis, um, Thailand's unemployment was only 1.2%. Um, and uh, we had the tourism sector to um, alleviate those sort of financial impacts. Um, people were still coming in no matter how bad the economy was worldwide. But with this pandemic, which is at a global scale and with restrictions of movement across the world, um, uh, Thailand is um, dealing with a very, very serious concern. And I think the full impact is still yet to come. Um, but uh, the, the, only, the best way is to create your own safety net um, you know, learn new skills, um, necessary, useful skills for the 21st century um, in order to make sure that if job opportunities come across, um, you are capable of, of taking those opportunities. Yeah, um, it's interesting to know uh, yeah, and, and thank you, Angel, for, for hosting us today. And I'm very uh, delighted to be here. Um, so Ghana is currently doing well with the management of uh, the COVID crisis. Um, we have a very high recovery and discharge rate, of which uh, over 44,000 people have been discharged or on recovery rate out of the 45,000 confirmed cases. And um, so with regards to education and how COVID has impacted our education system, and that is, so schools are still closed and there are talks as to when to reopen schools, especially for the pre tertiary education levels. Currently, there are also talks for the universities to reopen and we are hoping that we could create safe environment for schools and that is the key as our president has said, said earlier we cannot revive lives that have been lost uh, to COVID so as as a whole country holistic approach we are trying to save lives and students are very key to that regardless uh, most of our national transitional exams like the WASI, the BEC have been conducted. The BEC started just yesterday and would end on Friday. So in, in terms of education, we are, we are taking a holistic approach um, to safeguard young people. With regards to unemployment, before COVID, um, comparatively, young people were three times much more likely to be unemployed compared to adults. So you'd realize that COVID would extremely impact the unemployment status of young people compared to adults. 
this this draws the attention of governments taking proactive approaches and macro targeted solutions to ensure that young people are trans transitioning successfully into the labor market into higher levels of education as they may wish and i'll say that one of the issues that have been very critical as i talk to young people is the level of anxiety and the level of uncertainties and that comes in because there are no securities and guarantees of job even after so many years of going to school and COVID has handed us the opportunity to start rethinking what can government do what can young people do to secure and guarantee their future in the young in the labor market. And I think one of the things that come out that has been very on the minds of young people is the fact that uh, the labor market has not to a large extent it's valued the critical transferable skills that young people possess and can incorporate into the labor market. So as a result, um, you would you would, you see a job description that is asking entry level graduates to have a maximum or minimum of three years work experience, and we keep asking ourselves, how do young people get these experiences if the opportunities have not been created? And as someone who is a big advocate for technical vocational education and employer engagement, I think this is a great opportunity where we have to imbibe employer opportunity into especially our education system and our higher education systems where young people are given the opportunity to get access to work experience prior to them even graduating in school so that we know that we are getting the needed exposure to transition smoothly into the labor market. And I think this is a good chance for the world to take a greater turn to look at technical vocational education. Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm from the United States. I'm based in San Francisco. You can see the beautiful bridge behind me. But uh, unfortunately, it's actually a virtual background because right now we have um, massive fires that are actually obscuring uh, any of our views. So I would say that um, to comment on how the United States is doing during COVID is, is very complicated because it is quite a large country and I'm located on one coast. Uh, so depending on where you are in the country, it's a very different story. Uh, the governor of California has uh, not yet lifted the shelter in place. And uh, however, we don't have borders between states. So as much as California can try and report uh, good numbers when it comes to COVID, uh, we still see spikes and we still see politicians and policymakers in other counties and states and even the president making comments that just show a lack of education around the issue at hand. And the reason I bring that up is I think that it has affected um, both young graduates and the job market. Uh, there has been a huge unemployment rate uh, in the United States and there have not been very effective policy measures in place to mitigate that. And in addition, I would say that as much as there are um, incredibly inspiring youth that I work with, I work with entrepreneurs from all over the United States, students and young adults, um, there is a sense of fear that the government and educational institutions aren't doing enough to make sure that they're safe. And so um, there are options that I think young people are taking where they're pushing themselves online to find answers that they would usually find from either their teachers in schools or from their peers around them. And so even though in many ways it seems like a dire situation, I have to echo what Alice is saying is that the impetus for some educational institutions and for some educators and students themselves to go online to push themselves to learn those skills um, from a technical vocational standpoint has been really, really um, inspiring. And what is also surprising is that the youth that I work with have never been more 
positive and more inspired to actually change the way that they educate themselves and that they train themselves in order to become uh, workers for the future. So as much as it's an, a dismal situations in some way, there's also a lot of opportunities um, for young people to, to get creative about how they get their degrees and how they enter the workforce now. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you very much for a view. Um, as Forum for World Education aims to transform the education in answers to the skills and knowledge requirements of the current and future global society. And as many of you have also mentioned that COVID-19 um, may have to many extent disrupted many young professionals' career plans. So what should someone that's ambitious, that's a young, ambitious young professional having a dream, wanting to work, should do right now and to keep step, what should they do to keep stepping towards their dreams? Um, thank you very much, Angel. That is a very important question you've asked. And uh, the, the needless to say, there's no one answer to, to this question because of individual differences and contextual differences. Um, what young people might do in Ghana might definitely be different as to what other young people can do across the world to secure and work towards their aspirations. And that is to say that indeed young people globally have high aspirations. And I would like to talk or focus on a few things like five basic topics that um, from my own personal experience and from listening to other inspiring people around the world. I think first and foremost, what young people have to do is to have a sense or imbibe self-leadership. We have to take charge of our own present conditions and our future. And I, when I say self-leadership, I mean being intentional as to preparing and working towards our aspirations, setting goals. This comes back to being resilient, being self-aware, what you can do, what are your strengths and weaknesses. I would also talk about employer engagement. I would say this is a chance where you might not get the immediate job that you dream of, but are there other options that you can engage uh, with the labor market? What am I talking about? So there are internships, there are fellowships, there are job shadowing. These are short-term opportunities that employers should make available to young people and young people should take advantage of. I will go on to talk about young people rescaling and scaling up. So there are now a boom in online courses, some which are free, some which are, are, are paid for. And depending on your status and, and your income conditions, you can assess one of these things. And it's important to note that in Ghana, the Council for Technical Vocational Education in collaboration with um, the Commonwealth uh, Foundation has provided access for over 5,000 young Ghanaians to access for free an online software system called Coursera, where there are a lot of rescaling opportunities, training that young people can take advantage on. And, of, and also, this is a time for us not to live in isolation. So my advice is that young people should take advantage of their existing social capital. And in taking advantage of that, build upon new social networks. And when I say build upon new social networks, it means young people should begin to form collisions of ideas, should, be, should begin to form social networks that would help us get the needed information, will get, us, will get us to places where we want to be and how we envision our future, future to be. Uh, my last point will be for young people to take advantage of career and guidance uh, opportunities. And in, 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 in the light of COVID, we've realized that the so-called non-essential jobs that we once thought were not relevant have proven to be very relevant. And this is a time where we need to reassess ourselves whether our aspirations are indeed socially imbibing and socially beneficial. 
And this, we can realize this if we seek the, we seek the right information, if we seek the right support in terms of our career trajectory. And this goes back to uh, countries and organizations who would, who, who would provide these services, making it easily accessible to the youth to benefit from. Um, so these are the few points that I would advise self-leadership, employer engagement, taking advantage of rescaling and upscaling opportunities, career and guidance opportunities, and just being asked and being innovative and creative. Thank you, Alice. I could not agree with you more on the points that you made. And although you mentioned that the qualities that a young person might have in Ghana might differ than the qualities a young person might need in the United States, the things that you bring up, I think, um, are universal in aspects that we all need to really address. Um, so I've worked in cross-sector collaboration for almost a decade. So I've worked with nonprofits, government organizations, academic institutions, and now the private sector and something that I've known while working with uh, other young people and with students is, is that um, grit uh, is very, very important. And so that's based on the work of uh, Angela Duckworth, who really talks about building that into your own persona in order to kind of overcome obstacles and not let things like pandemics or natural disasters or economic um, shocks really get the best of what you want to accomplish. And so I think that for a young person that's ambitious, that really has a dream, having grit now more than ever is going to be a quality that's really needed. Um, and something that I mentioned the last time that we were together uh, at the forum is, is a growth mindset. And so um, I think now more than ever, we all need to have a growth mindset around how we can address these new changes um, towards what having a dream means. So knowing that uh, it's adaptable, that we can work on it, that it might not look exactly the way that we wanted it to pre-COVID is fine, but also for employers to recognize that in themselves as well. So something that I saw this summer is university students, new graduates, a lot of their opportunities for internships and paid opportunities um, dried up because of COVID and for safety reasons. And what I saw some companies and universities do is still have internship programs or at least structured learning programs for young individuals so that they could stay engaged. And so that's something I think um, adults and more importantly, just employers in general can really take advantage of this opportunity where we have young individuals, whether they are have gone to university or whether they're scrappy, have a lot of grit, have a lot of skills that they've learned themselves, willing to work and they want to build on those skills. And more importantly, they want to connect with other individuals that have like-minded interests. So as much as we wanna discredit um, young people for saying, oh, they understand technology, they know how to form communities online. What I'm really hearing from them is they still want structure. They still want to be part of programs that give them the skills that they need for tomorrow. And they want insight into companies and organizations that can help provide those skills today. And they're willing to listen and learn. Uh, they just need to know that those opportunities are still around. Thank you, Danny and Alice. Um, as you two both mentioning the importance of um, education in, to help promote economic development, I think that most of us would uh, agree that education matters a lot for economic growth and development. And to promote success in today's labor market and education, we need the participation not only from the government uh, and the non-for-profit sector, but also from the private sector. So FWE aims to encourage the conversations among policymakers, education experts, and business leaders. Education encourages the economic development. So my next question is, what elements should receive important attention during this economic recovery that um, during the COVID sessions? And what actions should the young leaders help, what actions should the young leaders take to help the economic recovery? 
Yeah, so um, I think if you look historically, the most um, advanced technologies um, happened, you know, the research, research and development of these technologies happened during times of war. And um, for us, we can very easily be in a situation where we under this illusion that the consequences of our situation is not as bad as war. Um, so not to, to scare anyone, but the potential of our situation um, could really be more catastrophic if we are, you know, under the perception that if we win this war, we return back to normal. And that is not so. We win this war if we've got exponential growth and exponential returns on the efforts that we make now. And I guess the, the question is, um, you know, what elements should we be focusing on right now to win this war that we are at? And um, I think it all starts not necessarily with a new model. You know, there's been centuries of, of development, um, specifically in the educational sector of how does education look? And I recall from our, our World Forum for Education in Paris last year that the system that has worked the past hundred years won't be the one working and taking us into the next hundred years. So what do we do? And um, I think the shift is fundamentally, you know, from a standardized approach to one that empowers the personal learning, um, not just of, of, of scholars or students, but of all ages. Um, it's the whole notion of, um, you know, lifelong learning and it's creating schedules um, suited to any context, but, you know, still, still consistent with the wider model framework, as Danny pointed out. Um, students still have the need and, and they want to feel part of something where there's structure. Um, and furthermore, there's, you know, the providing of, of constant development of core concepts within individuals and teams. Um, and then tracking those experiences and vocational training. If, if we start talking about, you know, the internships and um, job opportunities while studying, how do you actually track this? And then you have to ask yourself whether your standardized reporting would still be the same as we've, we've done um, the past hundred years. So the elements that, um, that I believe needs key focus, and there's a lot of them, um, but to highlight a few, I think we should focus on you know, community building. It's, it's so important. It's the whole notion of we shouldn't strive to build independent models, but rather a collaborative approach um, towards education. And then obviously purpose inspired learning. Um, what, what do you, what is, what do students and children dream of? You know, what is their purpose in life? And why can't we develop them um, within the Japanese term of ikigai? Um, that's, that's quite uh, something that's near to my heart for people to, to dream, especially during these times. Um, you should focus on, on, you know, be aware of the negative, but focus on the positive. Um, the values and vision is, is quite important, I, I believe, going forward um, as we establish you know, what is crucial for a student's learning, learning journey. It's really to understand that they've got a choice to live by certain personal values. And that choice of values really influences their preferred futures. Um, and alignment on personal values by, by all contributors to the, to the educational sector, um, that just speaks of longevity of, of whatever we're building um, during this time of war, if I can refer back to it. Um, relationships between um, institutions, communities, um, industries. It's, it's super important for, for institutions especially to realize, and I see um, one of our attendees asked a, a brilliant question on the, the chat, um, you know, about, about how do we de decentralize um, education away from physical land? And will there be a place for, for physical buildings and, and education in this time? Perhaps, but perhaps not. Um, I mean, that's why we build these relationships and, and develop a growth mindset amongst all the key players. Um, I believe there's, there's a few more elements such as, uh, you know, culture creation. Um, there's no time period associated to, to education when we talk about lifelong learning, um, but it's a whole culture, the whole notion needs to, to change. Um, and yeah, ensuring the well-being of students, I believe that education is something, um, you know, if, if there's a happy and a positive environment, all of the, the students can flourish. Um, so how do we do that when we start walking, working towards a decentralized model um, of education? So I, I really believe that um, a, key, a key driver of, of change is, is focusing on the skills, the competencies, 
Um, and, and obviously the learnings as well that students took from their educations, whether formal or informal. And um, the question needs to be asked, you know, if, like, like Danny pointed out, if there's an abundance of information available um, for students to self-educate themselves, how do you teach a minor which form of education and which information to use to educate themselves? And I firmly believe that industry um, gives us the, the best answer for that question. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just actually build on what Vesan is talking about, but put um, my, my own country's personal angle on it. And I, I talked about this at the last forum as well, is that the United States has entered an education crisis where there's been a divestment in education for about the past 30 years. And we're really seeing that come to light where schools are unevenly prepared uh, for this new digital landscape that we are encountering. Um, but obviously schools that have a growth mindset, have money, um, are able to better prepare and better adapt. And so I think businesses with the same type of mindset um, the, the same growth mindset are well prepared to help um, students and minors have the skill sets that we're looking for now. And so I do agree with Bassan in the sense that industry does play a huge role in helping actually with the recovery. Um, but one thing I think that we have to um, take into account when we're looking at what actions that we need to take in order to really address this economic recovery is that, and Bassan already mentioned this, um, we're not going back to a, a normal anytime soon, nor should we want to. It's the 21st century and I believe we need to use technology um, to build positive educational places. I think um, the way I have been interpreting it before is, is that technology and especially social media has been this wild west where it has been created very quickly but not regulated very well. And so something that I think young leaders can do is really take a lead in building positive digital spaces for learning. So right now we're seeing um, that Twitter or Facebook is the place where you go for your personal endeavors, but you also might educate yourself. You also might find some professional opportunities. That can be a very overwhelming place to go. Just imagine an, an in-person conference center that has no doors and no directions. So by us as individuals and as young leaders building regulated digital spaces that per have community guidelines, that have um, ways that we should conduct ourselves. I think that those places are no longer gonna be seen as, um, as bad places where only bad things happen online are gonna be seen as really inspiring places where changes happen. And I have to say like, this is being live streamed on on YouTube and on Facebook. And it's a wonderful place for us to gather. So as young leaders, we can use technology not as a crutch, but as a tool to build better educational spaces. And I think that um, both industry and the government should really look to young leaders to help shape that. Thank you, Basan and Danny, for emphasizing that we need creations in the education system. And I'm emphasizing that countries' education performance is really like closely linked with the economy performances. So um, you two both have mentioned that the importance uh, in the education is, you know, involved the importance of community building, emphasizing building the value and vision of students, ensuring the well-being of students, and focusing students' skills and competencies. Um, so my next questions for you all would be, uh, what actions would you suggest and is doing with the private sectors to help alleviate the current situation? So I actually prepared on this question for you, Angel. Um, I, I put together a little illustration and please allow me to share my screen. Um, it's something that I'm extremely, extremely passionate about and also fortunate to, um, to find myself in a position to actually be able to make this, this dream a reality. Um, can you just indicate that you can share my, see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Perfect. So um, we've been talking about involving industry, technology, experience, um, and institutions into you know a new way of learning. And um, if I can call, if I can 
put a name onto this concept, it would be SMEDX, <laughs> um, Smart Education and Experience um, All in One. And um, what you've got in front of you is, you know, you've got input from, from institutions, you've got input from industry, you know, there's a lot of people that we see that just wants to give back, they want to leave a legacy, they, they're usually above 50 years old or 60 years old, and they've got so much to give, but they don't have the platform. Um, similarly, institutions, I think, are, are slowly realizing, um, you know, perhaps the outdatedness of, of their models. So how do you combine everyone um, that are key role players in education without leaving anyone behind? And I firmly believe that blockchain and artificial intelligence is the answer to this. Well, some detail was that um, South Africa's power is having a little issue recently and told us if, you know, it was, he was froze for a second, we will give him 30 seconds to recover. And if not, we will invite Tim to keep on going. Sorry, um, is it me now? Yeah, please jump in while we're uh, waiting for Basan to jump back. Are we on education performance or? Hi, I think Basan's back. Okay. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to your first load shedding session if you haven't been in South Africa. So our power was, was cut off for, um, for a while, but mitigation strategy just kicked in. Um, so yeah, good to be back. Um, back to, to what I was saying, um, we believe that we believe that when we involve all the key players and we use blockchain to track the experience and also reward all of the, the contributors, whether they are whether they are from industry or institutions, um, there should be a mechanism of rewarding for input. So imagine a scenario where a, a child in Ghana needs to go and um, gather some firewood um, just you know, to be able to eat um, at night and in the evenings. And what, as opposed to going out and spending three hours gathering wood, um, he could rather go and complete a course um, and through blockchain, he gets rewarded in cryptocurrency. And that cryptocurrency can immediately be exchanged into a fiat currency for him to go and buy something at the store. So what have you actually done? You've paid the student to study. Isn't that completely different to what we, what, what we know? Um, if we look at the two main reasons why, why students stop studying, it's either because of a lack of funding or because of the lack of, of relevance to what they want to do. Is and we believe through artificial intelligence, we're able to curate any course um, for a student to follow. And, and it's, it's artificial intelligence that gives the guidance um, towards a career. Now, the last, the last point that I want to touch on is, is dynamic reporting. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone on the call has got a CV, um, but not a CV as of two minutes ago. And when we talk about dynamic reporting, it's, um, you know, your experience levels, um, your, your, your training and your education level today is already looking different than what it was yesterday. But how do you track it? Okay, and that's where blockchain comes in again. Um, we really believe that this, this very simple illustration um, with some, some tangible um, solutions that we've built on the back end um, is, is revolutionary to, to education and involving all of the key players um, through, through the private sector enabling this notion. Right. Um, I just wanted to comment uh, earlier on about uh, education performance. Um, there's a direct correlation between education performance and the economy. Obviously, if uh, a country has high education performance, um, there's an abundance of skilled labor, and that obviously translates into a higher economic productivity. But the more important underlying correlation um, to the economy 
is the flexibility and adaptiveness of the, the labor market. Um, take Thailand, for example, um, the agriculture sector contributes 10% um, to the entire GDP, but it employs a third of the entire country's workforce. Now, once agriculture technology becomes um, a norm, for instance, uh, is the Thai labor market quick enough and flexible enough to, to um, change at the pace of other countries? Um, same with the uh, tourism sector that I've mentioned earlier, uh, we are feeling the impact uh, instantly within just four or five months of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, unfolding. Um, a lot of people who have spent their entire lives in the tourism sector, they don't have the capacity to, to adjust. Um, their whole lives for several generations is just um, the tourism sector, it's just the agriculture. So uh, I think that uh, for the private sector to play an important role, and this is something that the Thai Ministry of Education has pushed forward for, is to bridge the gap. And what I mean by bridge the gap is to bridge the gap between the private sector and the public sector. Uh, as Danny mentioned, it's all about um, uh, collaboration uh, rather than individual uh, initiatives. Um, so obviously the government uh, is the one writing the curriculum and the private sector is the one providing jobs. If they're not speaking to one another, the curriculum doesn't answer to the market demands for, for the labor. So I think, the private sector will make an immense um, impact into resolving this issue if they help guide the curriculum. Uh, it's not like uh, the youth would, would know what they would have to know to uh, achieve their goals and their aspirations. Um, and obviously the safety net is to have the skill sets that are necessary for the 21st century. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, one quick comment uh, maybe from two of you about um, you know, reopening schools during COVID aroused a number of debates. Solving the school problem is crucial for both parents and kids. How can the young leaders support the reopening plans of schools? And what can the young professionals do to contribute to the world as the world is meeting this unprecedented challenge? So young people are being proactive during COVID and as um, most of other of my panelists have said, um, but some talking about creating jobs uh, through our own efforts. I think one of the greatest things young people can do for school recovery and for our economies is to be responsible citizens. And when I say responsible citizens, is young people recognizing the times that we find ourselves and trying to obey the social distancing, uh, the maxing up protocols and not taking for granted the fact that COVID hasn't affected the youth that much because whatever we do affect a, a greater community and that is taking a, a collective approach I think talking about social media and technology, young people can be in the position of creating awareness of reopening plans and creating trust between uh, communities, between families and schools. And when I say creating the awareness, in Ghana, for instance, where they are a divide between urban and rural communities, as we see in other countries, it is time that young graduates, young students who understand English, who can translate what the recovery plans are to their mothers, fathers, so that they believe that the institutions are ready to accept young people back to school. And that will facilitate um, the easy transitioning. And I think young people should take advantage of COVID and be innovative and creative in designing remedial interventions. So for instance, when I was back in Ghana, I would gather young people and I had a project called the Homework Scheme where every child in my neighborhood at the end of the day will come to my house and I'll supervise homeworks. Um, this is a simple task that I do, 
but have impact on what the children do and making sure that they are learning. And this could translate into other forms of support in, in giving back to schools and to our communities, to helping young people catch up in the learning loss that we are seeing as a result of school closures due to COVID. So that would be what, what I would suggest young people can do in our own small ways to contribute to the reopening of schools. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry we are very in short of time and uh, as we need to be mind of the time and we're having a great panel that is coming up. Um, so I'm going to pass on uh, the stage to Edith Shin and Edith will mo be moderating the next panel. Thank you very much again. Hello. Hello. A very warm welcome to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am Edith Chi, your moderator for this session. It was, wouldn't you say, a very interesting and well-planned and thought-out session uh, with these young people. Very impressive. I am a steering committee member of the Forum for World Education and a trustee of Teachers College, Columbia University. Although I spent most of my university years learning to be a teacher, I have not actually taken up a profession in education. After spending 25 years practicing law, my day job now is executive director of P.K. Hutchison Holdings, a Fortune 500 company operating in 50 countries. But education is still very close to my heart. I teach and learn every day at work. Historically, education has been the primary responsibility of governments, be it primary, secondary, or higher education. In addition to government funding, there is private funding from parents or students taking a loan, as well as funding from charities and foundations in the form of donations and endowments. Further, there is an increasing trend of support from businesses whereby universities would collaborate with corporates in the development of specific programs and skill sets, such as job focused technical skills, general skills like critical thinking, problem solving, community, a communication and teamwork. The global financial crisis in 2007 to 2008 led to a decade long retrenchment in government spending across much of the world. In many countries, education and higher education in particular, bore a disproportionate share of cutbacks, in part because spending on universities is typically seen as more discretionary compared to spending on healthcare, welfare, and primary and secondary education. With me today are three renowned scholars and experts who will look into how we finance the future of education, the alignment of resources with the needs, the fulfillment or otherwise shortfall of graduates against expectations of our enterprises and the challenges as well as opportunities presented to our education system and collaborators in particular in this COVID-19 environment. In alphabetical order, I wish to first introduce Professor Michael Goering. Professor Goering is the chairman of the board of directors of Site Foundation, Eblin and Gert Busserios in Hamburg. Right. He was awarded 
Federal Cross of Merit First Class of the Federal Republic of Germany in 2006 for his services to the Foundation's work. And in 2009, he was awarded the Dr. Gunther Book Prize for his work in the field of humanities, the Foundation, and as a novelist. His books are quite interesting. Further, Professor Goering is one of the initiators of the chapter of Digital Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which was published at the end of November 2016. Our second panelist is Mr. Albert Ng, an FWE steering committee member and the chairman of Ernst & Young Greater China, at which he oversees all service functions of his firm in 28 locations and over 18,000 staff members. With over three decades of accounting and advisory experience, Mr. Ng has maintained strong relationship with government and regulatory agencies in China. And he holds various advisory roles in government and professional bodies, both in Hong Kong and in China. He is a pioneer in China investment advisory and has in-depth knowledge of China Belt and Road initiatives and state-owned enterprises. Our third panelist, Mr. Joseph Sing, oh dear, Sangemana, Sangemana, is that all right? That's correct. It's the director for the MasterCard Foundation's African Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in Information and Communication Technology. I have to look this up, ITC. Uh, based in Kigali, Rwanda. The center aims to spark innovation and promote promising practices in the use of ICT for teaching and learning and catalyze significant improvements in secondary education across Africa. Since this is a smaller panel, and I thought we had an extra 15 minutes, um, apparently we have to shrink by 15 minutes and maybe the host could tell us whether we still have 45 minutes uh, for our three panelists. Our panelists, anyhow, we were planning to each spend about six to eight minutes sharing their views on the subject matter. And we will spend the remaining time, hopefully about 15 minutes to deepen our discussions through, question, uh, through a question and answer session. Now let us hand over the floor to Mr. Sing, Singamana to be followed by I will call you Joseph from now on, to be followed by Professor Goering and then Mr. Ng. Over to you, Joseph. Well, thank you very much, Edith. And please call me Joseph. <laughs> uh, let, let me first start by uh, um, thanking the Forum for World Education for inviting the MasterCard Foundation and myself to take part in this rather important conversation. Uh, I'll just share some thoughts uh, with you to kick it off on, the, on, this, on this issue of uh, financing education. Um, and I will speak from the African context. Um, being aware of the time that I shrunk, I'll try to make sure that I shrink my remarks as well and make room for distinguished uh, panelists as well to hear from them, uh, from the uh, uh, you know, European and Chinese or Asian uh, point of view. Um, this is a particularly important topic uh, from the African context, because if you look at the, uh, the funding uh, of education across the African countries, you will notice that African countries invest an important percentage of their budget in education. Um, but that percentage, though significant in number, when you look at the overall amount that gets invested in education is rather small uh, if you compare that to the needs that the continent has. Mm. Uh, this does place a significant burden on the parents. Um, I, I think Judith did mention the fact that you see parents and families contributing to the education. In Africa, this rises to about 30%. Uh, UNESCO put a 30 plus percent uh, uh, of the cost that their parents and families do shoulder. Um, this is a significant burden, particularly to the families that uh, are less fortunate. 
Um, and so given those uh, realities, it is imperative that we do explore additional funding resources for education. Um, and so before we look at those additional resources, we, we have to look at the, the current resources and they examine the efficiency with which those resources are spent. Um, and I think that uh, it is not a mystery to anyone that there is room for improvement when it comes to efficiency and equity within the spending of the, uh, of the public, uh, public budget that's been allocated to, um, to education. Uh, furthermore, we need to look at what's being funded. Uh, by and large, you find that this funding takes place um, around the salaries of teachers and the infrastructure limited to the buildings in which education takes place. So is that the right funding or the right model given the current uh, situation that we live in, not, not just the COVID-19, but the 21st century in general? Um, so that's something that we need to interrogate um, and, and create some efficiencies around that. Uh, secondly, we need to look at the, at the, the private uh, and public partnership when it comes to funding education. Uh, this is an area where there is a lot of improvement that can be done in Africa. Uh, we have not seen as much partnership in Africa between the public and the private sector as, we see, as we've seen elsewhere. And this is actually very important, particularly for the uh, vocational training uh, and for the uh, tertiary uh, sector. On the vocational training, uh, the partnership with the, uh, with the private sector has the twin benefits of one, making sure that the education that the, and the training that students are getting is relevant uh, for the workforce that's available and the workforce of the future but also it does add some funding that comes from the, the private sector to the overall resources that go to continuous uh, funding education. At the university level, we have not seen a lot of uh, R&D taking place on a continent. And, and that's an area in which we really need to, uh, to, to look further into and make sure that increase. Now, uh, R&D at the, at the university, uh, you know, segment, it, does, it has two purposes. One is that it really creates that uh, um, relevance of an education that take place, that's taking place at university, but also it does provide funding for the institution themselves. It creates in intellectual properties upon which uh, the university can get needed funding and needed resources. So this is an area I think that can be quite, um, you know, has not really been tapped into um, and, and needs to be looked into when it comes to the universities um, in Africa. So, I mean, if you look at those, uh, those uh, areas that I've, I've uh, uh, mentioned, I think that uh, you will see that there is a bit of room in which we can generate some additional resource that can go into, into funding, um, funding education. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention quick, quickly that one of the important things that we need to change or adjust is our, our very mindset that education uh, is somehow separated from education development. Um, indeed, we need to look to think and look at education as, as the engine that powers the overall economic development. Uh, we need to look at it because that's what actually it is. Um, and with that view, we'll start to explore more funding than we've explored before. So let me stop and pause there and we will continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, jo uh, Joseph is done. How about Michael now? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having invited me and for organizing this panel, which has proven to be very, very excellent. I would like to direct your attention to mentoring programs. Mentoring programs may seem to you to be a little bit old fashioned, but I think they are a very good instrument to make a connection between university students 
and mentee, young kids at primary school and at secondary school. And mentoring programs can add to education at rather low cost because they may involve also private money from private sources. The program that the Zeitstiftung, which is a public benefit charitable foundation here in Germany, put on in 2014, was put on because the PISA studies always showed us that Germany was not doing that very well and that we have a problem with many kids who do not get parental support. And they turn six and seven and they go to school, but they find it very difficult to change from primary school to secondary school when they turn 10. So we asked professors at the local university whether they would like to speak to their students, students who want to become teachers, whether these students would be prepared to become mentors to three kids each. And we found a lot of students who wanted to do that, and we finance the student. The student receives 15 euro per hour, and the student does four hours every week with three kids at a certain school. The student goes to the school, and there he finds these three kids every week on Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon, and he works with these three kids. He um, encourages them. He helps them to read well, to calculate well, and so on. And he does this for a period of three years. Sometimes the student, the university student, can only do one and a half years, and then another student will go on for the second one, one and a half years. But the kids between the age of nine and 12, or 10 and 13, receives this special mentoring program for three years all in all. And the result has been tremendous so far. These students have really gone on because they were encouraged and they found a friend with a university teacher, not just a tutor who helps them to go on with their academic um, skills, but also someone who helps them with getting on with society. As many of these young 9, 10, 11 year old kids are migrants. You know, in Germany in 2015, more than a million people from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Iraq came to Germany. And many of them were young families with small kids, with young kids. So most of our students, our university students who are mentored, work with migrant kids. And it's so important for these young boys and girls to have a friend who knows about Germany, some of these mentors have come to Germany 10 or 15 years ago, and they know their world and their experience. So the mentoring program has really proven to be quite successful. And what helped us as a private foundation, we found many other people in Germany who thought of this program and who wanted and wants to help us. So we get financial aid from companies from individuals, and we make these individuals godfathers or godmothers to three or six or nine or 30 kids. And there are some companies who like to show their involvement with the city by taking on the responsibility for a whole school and helping us to employ 10 or 15 mentors there who take care of 45 children. So it's really a program that can encourage companies to help, the, to help the city to go on with their educational needs. And it helps for the young mentees, the young girls and boys who get support in that way. We increase the program now. We also have started programs in other cities in Germany. And we have started programs that help kids between 17 and 19 when they finish secondary education and want to become young well, workers, apprentices with companies, and we help them for two years to get this transfer from school to job in a good way and in a successful manner. 
So I would encourage to think about the old fashioned model of mentoring programs again. Thank you for this short introduction. Thank you, Joseph. Um, Albert. Uh, thank you, Edith. Um, when uh, we look at uh, the funding for education, uh, I must say I echo your earlier comment, Edith. Uh, I would suggest um, the government as the main custodians of the system, they should be responsible primarily for education. So uh, when we look at it, uh, when I look at the data in China, uh, when China started up back in the 90s, the GDP, I mean, education spend in terms of GDP is about 2.5%. And the Chinese government has spending a lot more uh, into education. When we look at the GDP in China, it has grown significantly. However, one thing that is important is the percentage on education spend in China continue to move up. And this is a very pleasing trend from my perspective. Uh, and now it's, it's over 4.2%. So I think this is a, a move in the right directions. In that regard, I would say government must be primarily responsible for the funding of education. Uh, when I look at it, uh, a very interesting uh, observation, uh, just want to echo what Joseph mentioned earlier. Uh, the developed countries seems to have more spend on education. Governments spend more on the GDP percentage on education. Whereas some of the poorer country, uh, it's a matter of affordability. Uh, I trust many governments would like to spend more. Unfortunately, uh, due to the country's financial situations, uh, when they look at it, the Developing countries, the poorer countries, tend to spend less in terms of uh, on education in terms of the GDP percentage. Uh, so that is something that we need to look at and see how uh, I mean the world can work with each other to help to to the, the poorer governments, poorer countries, uh, to be able to spend more on education or. Uh, can we uh, identify some of the students and give them the opportunity to study elsewhere? I mean, would that be something uh, that we can do? I remember when China uh, was still very poor, developing countries uh, back in the poorer days of China, there are many, many Chinese students that were sent overseas to get educations and they returned to China and be pioneers in different fields and something that we, we, we can try to think about. Having said that, when we look at private funding, I would argue private funding can only be a supplement. It's important, but it can only be a supplement uh, to the public funding. And when I look at the private funding, I divide it into four categories. One is alumni donations. Alumni donations, is very, very popular in the US uh, and elsewhere, maybe in the Western countries. Unfortunately, it's not very common in China. It's still learning. The Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, the wealthy people in China, this is something, the wealth they only accumulated in the last 20, 30 years. So something very new to them. As a result, uh, many of the alumni donations is not as huge or not as significant as many of uh, our friends in the US. I mean, you look at the US private university in the US, a lot of the funding is coming from the alumni. Uh, and I would like to see more uh, in China. The second part of it is in terms of enterprise. As you mentioned uh, earlier, Edith, I would say enterprises, uh, there are many, many enterprises in China that are getting bigger and very significant. And these companies, are able to donate more in terms of uh, education. Uh, I would suggest many of these enterprises, I would rather them spend money, spend funding in R&D or postgraduate research, mm -hmm. rather than just the generic education. Generic education, I would say the government should be primarily responsible for. But enterprises 
should focus because of the limited resources. They should focus more on R and T, R and D, and research type projects. The third element that I would suggest people can think about is: Can we have more practical projects that will both give the practical experience to the students and at the same time provide funding to the universities as well? I use one example at EY. We have these program, an annual program, what we call the most promising enterprises. We try to identify the next Facebook, the next uh, Google, I mean, the companies that are up and coming. In order to do, do those analysis, we engage Fudan universities in Shanghai. They are graduate students to do the research, identification of potential companies that will be the future leaders in the fields. And this is both providing training opportunity to them and at the same time providing funding to them. So something that we can think about. The last element that I would suggest uh, may be slightly sensitive in China is, can we use charitable organization? I use charitable organizations. I'm learning from Hong Kong. I mean, born in Hong Kong. There are many schools in Hong Kong that are in fact funded by religious bodies. Maybe the Catholics, the Christians, or the Buddhist, uh, something that we can think about. I will use the generic term charitable organizations. Uh, many of them can also help to fund uh, education as well. Then, if I move to the next topic, in terms of something that I would be interested to, to say is how can we ensure consistency of education? When we look at government spending, uh, I would say it's important that we use the total funding to the different levels in a sensible manner. Rather than just spending money in the higher education, I use the U.S. example. I could be wrong because I, I have never lived in the U.S., but it's only my own observation is there are all over the world students trying to study in the U.S. There are many, many students all over the world who want to study in the US in terms of university or postgraduates. However, you look at the primary or secondary school education in the US, I would say there's still significant rooms for improvement. In that sense, I would suggest probably the government, the US government have not spent enough in terms of the primary or secondary educations or not sufficient uh, compared to high uh, university. So I would say University education in the U.S. is probably one of the best in the world, but I'm not so sure about their secondary educations. Then uh, in terms of China, China has, I mean, Chinese plays a lot of significance on education. I mean, Chinese families. Uh, and I would say in China, the government have not spent enough on pre-elementary education, the kindergarten, etc. Most of the the, the families would send their kids uh, to private kindergartens. And this is something that we may want to look at is we need to look at building up the kids when they were very young. So I think uh, it's probably more spending in, in that area. Uh, in terms of China, I would also hope when we look at the funding in terms of education, I would say I would like to see us spending more money to improve the compensation and the academic research environment to the teachers, the professors, and researchers. Uh, something that is important because uh, when we are spending money, uh, I would say we need to ensure uh, the academic staff, uh, the research people get sufficient recognitions and sufficient compensation so that uh, of course, we're not asking them to be very wealthy people, but at least it will be respected, uh, a, a, a good life, uh, in the sense, a comfortable life, uh, in, in that, uh, something that we want to look at. A further uh, comment is uh, in terms of, uh, because of the COVID-19, we look at it, uh, how can we improve virtual education? Uh, I think some, this is a topic that a lot of people have talked about. Something I'm pleased to say is in China, the government has spent a lot on the infrastructure. This is not something school can do. It relies on government. We've done a good infrastructure and 5G is building rapidly in, in China. So that network infrastructure is important and only the government can do it. 
So in China, I'm pleased to, to see government has spent a lot in that area. On the other hand, I would say enterprise can help to provide equipment to some of the poorer area. Uh, I would argue, for example, in Africa, something that we can look at is many enterprises, including at EOI, uh, every three, four years, we change our computers. These computers are still very usable after three, four years. However, because of the speed, they may not be able to be used uh, some of the more complex solutions or, of, or applications of the companies. However, if we are just using them for education, going to get online uh, learning, etc., they are still very usable. How can we reuse those computers? And those computers, when you sell it, it's very, very cheap. It's, when you go and sell in the market, so a lot of the companies, I would say, would be very pleased to do donations. Uh, we channel all these computers for some more meaningful use. Something that we should be looking at. Uh, uh, every year, we in, in EY China, we donate these computers to some of the developing area in Tibet, in Qinghai, uh, et cetera. So we have been doing some of those donations and I'm sure more companies, a lot of companies will be interested, would not mind doing that. So something that we want to look at. My final point, uh, because of the time, I speak probably too, too much is, uh, one thing that I would suggest is um, government spend a lot of money on education. And somehow, I would say we maybe should consider how can we do uh, some measurements uh, to see how education money, whether they are well spent, how can we ensure the spending per education will optimize all the outcome per dollar invested? Measuring the success of education. I know it's a, not something easy uh, to measure, but I think something that we should be looking at, uh, making sure uh, all the money spent on education are uh, used wisely, uh, efficiently. So uh, I, I, was, I would try to stop here, Edith, and giving back you some time uh, for discussion. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting thoughts. I have been taking notes and uh, creating even more questions. And I don't know whether we would have enough time to cover all, but I would like to start from uh, a Michael first, because what you described really uh. Um, rang a bell in me. I have uh, for the past 20, 30 years been mentoring students and uh, these students have grown up. They are in the workforce. Uh, some of them come back to work for me and they have become lifelong friends. But Michael, your mentorship program are with young children, young, cho young people mentoring younger people. I find it really very interesting. And in a situation in Germany where you have migrants, and in Hong Kong we do have migrants as well, and I'm sure in many other countries um, uh, of our participating audience, uh, it is most meaningful. I understand that you are also recruiting these mentors when they grow up in due course to come into the field of education. Can you shed some light on that? And um, I, I find this a win-win situation. You know, you train a teacher and then you help somebody to grow up. And, and I, I, I know that you have funding because you are supported by a, a very strong foundation, but what are the soft issues not money. I, I'm so glad to hear a 15 euro an hour. In Hong Kong, our minimum wage is about five euro or six. So can you share with us some of the biggest challenges you have in running a program like that? And uh, do you have issues recruiting and retaining these young people to act as mentors? Yeah, first of all, you need a very good relationship with the local universities or the local teaching, uh, teachers training seminars. And then we made sure that the student who offered to become a mentor would be given credit hours for it, 
at the local university. Then we made sure that the student will receive, as I said, something like 15 hours per hour, uh, 15 euros per hour, which comes up to around 400 euro per month. And that is really a fine salary for a student that he or she would otherwise try to get by catering or by uh, helping out at some other thing. So it's uh, rewarding also on that side, but what most of our university students find is they get a very good connection to their later job because they suddenly enter a school every week. They are together with these three kids that they take care of, but they are also taken on by the other teachers at the school. They learn about, they learn a lot about what they want to do further on. That also helps um, a lot. We do not have a problem to recruit the students Sometimes for the older mentees, as I said, the mentees that are 17, 18, 19 and need more vocational training, but with the younger kids, it's not a problem, it's not a problem at all. But I must also say that 10 years ago or 12 years ago, we started a program with the local high school for the 16, 17, 18 year olds with a migrant background, and we asked them. What about becoming a teacher? So many students here in Germany, once they do, they finish their secondary education, want to become engineers or doctors, but not so many want to become teachers. So we put on special programs for inviting 18 year olds with a migrant background to become teachers. We help them to become teachers and suddenly in our classrooms in Hamburg, about 20% of the teachers now have a migrant background. There used to be only 8% when we started the program in 2007. So it's quite an increase now, and I think it's so important for our German schools, for our German parents, and for our German kids, that they see in their classes, they are not just other students with a migrant background, but also our teachers have a migrant background. They're much more diverse. That's really an important thing for the, for the country, because our country always thought not to be an immigration country, but they suddenly found out Germany is an immigration country. So we do quite a lot on various on various areas here with these programs to um, help young kids by offering them mentors. And as I said, some of the mentors are young stu are students whom we have invited to become teachers and who have a migrant background as well. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the other panelists, please feel free to collaborate um, if, if you find it uh, fit to do so. Joseph, you want to say something? Uh, sure. I mean, it, this is quite quite an interesting program. Um, and I think that uh, that near mentor um, would actually uh, provide an opportunity for young people to connect with them rather than a much older person. Uh, and I've seen it work um, in, in other circumstances as well. So it's definitely something worth looking into. It would be interesting to explore how do we, how do, we do it, uh, particularly in the rural area, uh, when I think of uh, in the African context, uh, because they tend to be further from universities uh, and, uh, and these higher institutions. So that could be one of the formula, perhaps using technology that might be one way of accelerating such connection, uh, but definitely is something that uh, is worth looking into as an alternative way of uh, increasing quality uh, within the education system. Thank you. I think, I think it, it's a very good hint that when you talked about the new possibilities via internet, but we found out that once we had to go on to the internet completely uh, at the beginning of uh, March, that it worked with all the young mentees, the young kids, when they already had found a close, a close friendship with their mentors, then it didn't mean such a big change for them to suddenly receive the mentorship via WhatsApp or via the PC or via the tablet. But to start this from the very beginning with kids living in rural areas, we found it very difficult. These kids needed a personal 
connection with the mentor first, and then it could be added by some virtual device. Mm. Very true. Um, I, I like to add an anecdote about mentors and mentees. I have a mentee from Columbia University when she was doing her um, undergraduate studies, uh, spending one summer in Hong Kong as an intern. Um, so they are all allocated a mentee. So I was her mentor. She said the fact that she learned about mentorship from me, and then when she went back to Columbia, she started to mentor other younger uh, students, you know, university students. Mm -hmm. That got her admitted to Harvard University. She subsequently applied for law school. And mm -hmm. in her essay, she said, what I have learned during my summer in Hong Kong is about mentorship. And when I come back to America, I started mentoring other younger uh, students. And, and she said that's probably what got her uh, admitted to Harvard, it made her a little bit special. Now, since we're talking about technology, maybe we could just um, get on with that. COVID-19 has accelerated the ongoing trend to toward e-learning and other forms of remote learning. Government support, and um, Albert, you alluded to that, and other forms of, uh, and, uh, and the private sector investment in education technology uh, have surged tremendously in recent years. For example, to address the digital gap that deprives underprivileged students from receiving online education, we understand that the government of China has mobilized all major telecom service providers to boost internet connectivity service for online education providers, especially for the underserved regions. I remember about three weeks ago, I was running everywhere acquiring tablets for, there was a charity uh, that was uh, coming up with the money to buy 2000 tablets to give away to uh, students uh, that cannot afford uh, having uh, a device. They were studying at home, of course, everybody is at home, from using an iPhone, the father's iPhone, and the father has to use the iPhone too. So we run around uh, canvassing all the tablets around town. Now, um, so in your jurisdiction, what is the biggest challenge to the provision of effective online education in terms of imparting knowledge, because the, um, the teaching is different, um, in terms of achieving cost reduction, as well as increasing accessibility? This is my first question. My second question, please, could you give some examples of how education technology has been used effectively as a means to bridge gaps in education infrastructure and teaching resources. Anyone? Robert? Yeah, if I may just uh, get, just get started first. Is, uh, uh, I would say China has been very fortunate. I mean, Chinese students in, in that way is fortunate in, in terms of, I've traveled around the world. What I notice is the internet connections the network in China is probably one of the best in the world. Uh, even during 4G time, uh, probably because of the, of the population, uh, even you go to the countryside, you still have quite strong signals. Uh, uh, whereas uh, if you go to even some of the very, uh, some of the bigger cities, I remember in London, if you are going on M4, I mean, there are so many parts of the highway, you have no connectivity. Uh, big surprise to me, uh, you have, would have thought London as a big city, the connections would be great. Unfortunately, it is not. But in China, I would say, even if you go to the third tier, fourth tier cities, uh, most of them have very good network. So the government has good network in China. So that is something I'm pleased to say. 
uh, that provides the, the backbone uh, for e-learning. Then in terms of equipment, as you just mentioned about tablets, uh, iPhones, computers, uh, that is something that we, there's a lot of room for improvement from that perspective. Because as I mentioned, look at it, uh, iPhone is going to launch an, another new version of iPhone. I, I don't know when. Uh, I'm not an, an Apple. I mean, I use iPhone, but I'm not an Apple fan. I'm not going to chase for the newest model <laughs> of the iPhone. But you look at it, it says so many people who change the iPhone or the phone. It's more like a fashionable items. So one of those, when they get outdated, it's not going to be, have a very high resale value. I'm sure a lot of people would be pleased to donate that for charitable purposes. Many of the companies, as I mentioned, uh, every three, four years, uh, people have to change companies, get their computer changed into a newer, newer versions. So how can we put those into more meaningful use? That would be the point that I want to say. There are a lot of rooms that we can do, a lot of efforts that we can do so that the leader people, and these leader people, I would argue, does not only mean leader people in China. Uh, there are a lot of leader people in many of the developing countries in the world. Can we have a more systematic program? Uh, because as far as I'm concerned, education, we should try to provide education to everyone, irrespective of race, religion, nationality. This is maybe against Mr. Trump's comments, but uh, this is Albert's way. I mean, I think... Education is education. We should be providing education to everyone equal, uh, irrespective of their nationality, etc. So, from that perspective, I would say uh, we 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 maybe we can think about using this forum. Can we have a a kind of program to try to source a lot of these outdated? When I say outdated, they are still very useful. It's just it's just for education. So. Uh, can we make those into more useful, more meaningful use? So that is my, my suggestion, very quickly. If, uh, if the forum would start a program on collecting used phones, I donate all of my used phones. I have a whole drawer of them, starting from the beginning <laughs> of 3G. I'm glad that would be put to good use. Yeah. Um, all right, I like to uh, look at a more serious question. COVID-19 has had immense impact on world economy and inevitably on the future of the job market. Our young um, um, members have just discussed that. But from our point of view, people that are in business, what is your view about the job market post COVID-19? And what is entailed in preparing our graduates for this market? I'd like to start uh, the conversation going I like to look at old economy and new economy. With the pandemic, we have come to realize how the basics of daily life cannot be overlooked in as much as technology is running at a thousand miles. The basics like healthcare, medical care, transportation, food, agriculture, etc. And as well as the new normal using technology in our daily life, educating our students and carrying on business activities, the use of AI, 5G, research and development, etc. And these will become more and more important. However, I'm not of the view that basic education of the next generation to be ethical and moral citizens, to be honest persons with integrity and trustworthiness, together with a learning and creative mindset. Yeah. Being able to transfer one's learning is just as important as specific knowledge in a profession or a trade. I like your comments, please. Well, I think uh, COVID-19 has really meant a big push towards well, a different way of education and also it has meant that we all accept e-learning and that we accept the new situation. After COVID-19, it will not be the same as before. We will live in a different world. And I think it is up to us to accept this and to also work on this. And if we give this further to our children and to, to our students, 
that they have to be prepared for change, for constant change. I think that's something that's really very important. And uh, we have seen that COVID-19 has really meant us to accept the necessity for constant change, for constant, continuous learning, never stop learning, always trying to get the best out of the situation that has come. And I would agree with you. Sorry. To say, and I definitely agree with that. I think that um, actually one of the things that COVID-19 has highlighted is the necessity to move education from a school-centric approach to a learning-centric approach. So you don't have to be in the walls of a school to learn. You can learn from anywhere. Um, and, and I think that this was so evident when COVID-19 hit and everybody was confined to home. And now people start to scramble as to what do we do now, um, realizing that learning needs to take place everywhere, not just in the classroom. And technology can be a very useful tool uh, to, to see that. And we, I mean, I, I think we, every, wherever region you look at, there is evidence of that. Even in the um, resource constraint areas here in Africa, we have seen incredible increase of use of technology. Uh, there is a particular uh, organization we work with, the Mascot Foundation, called Lightmore in Kenya. They had a learning uh, app that was was having about roughly about a thousand downloads per month. In the first month of COVID, it went from one thousand to one hundred thousand downloads. Um, just to show you how people just pivoted immediately to try to find ways of continuing to learn. So the importance of learning, as Judith highlight, highlighted, is there and there is a need, there is a desire to continue learning. Um, and COVID has also identified that we need to look at learning not only in the confines of walls of school, but everywhere. And I think technology will be a, um, an enabler for that. Um, Edith, uh, I, I just want to uh, echo your earlier point. I would say education is a longer term. Uh, we need to have a longer term thinking in terms of education. Uh, we cannot just have to knee jerk reactions uh, because of certain something happens. We try to think about doing something completely different. I, I use some example. I agree with your point that when we are trying to train people, we want to train people who are more all-rounded. We want to train people who have ethics, who have integrity. I think this is fundamental in some education. I remember uh, at one point uh, when I was studying at universities, everyone was trying to study finance. At that time, investment banker is a very sexy job. So everyone want to be investment bankers. And at that time, I was worried we do not have our best students who are applying, who are studying engineering. And then I think about these engineers who build bridges, who build buildings, are they safe? Because we are not getting the best people to study those subjects. So I was a, a little bit worried. So this is the kind of reaction when we look at it. Because of COVID-19, we are seeing also, uh, I would say investment banker is now not the sexy job anymore. So people, less people studying finance. More people are going to study AI system, software engineers, data analysts, etc. What I really hope is we need to ensure there's an even distribution. Yes, these are jobs that are selling my like hotcakes right now, but there are also other subjects that are as important. So I think, so in terms of education, I really hope one of the things that we need to emphasize is uh, we want to develop some more all-rounded people who have the ethical standard with the integrity that will serve the world in the future. I think that is important in terms of education. Thank you very much. I actually have um, quite a few other topics to cover, but I think uh, it's about time. In Hong Kong, it's almost 10 past 11. Um, this is a most um, insightful discussion. And I learned a, a lot researching to just being a moderator. And um, we can conclude that um, education continues to be the responsibility of governments. 
that's where the, the largest amount of funding would come forth. But we have increasingly been seeing uh, charities, foundations providing funding as well as uh, commercial enterprises. Collaborative work with universities uh, uh, is actually very, very meaningful. Uh, not just providing the funding, but providing the jobs and also in due course, you know, these, um, um, these uh, university churned out graduates would be more um, adapted to uh, the commercial world, having collaborated with uh, enterprises. And um, I hope this COVID-19 will be gone soon and everybody stay safe. And hopefully soon, the forum could have face-to-face -face conferences. Uh, yet we have learned to live a different life. Uh, as Joseph said, you can learn everywhere. And my employer would say, you can work anywhere and everywhere. Have a good day or a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're not. Yeah, I'll let you go. Thank you.